For all the heady heights he reached as a beetle, John Lennon was an intensely human human being. It's curious, of course, that such a pronouncement should have to be made when discussing the life of a contemporary composer, but such was the power and glory of his accomplishments that people often find it difficult to understand that he lived, tried, and died just like anyone else. There was, of course, significant magic to the man, which was far more deeply rooted in his rather ordinary suburban upbringing than any mischief he got up to later with LSD, the Maharishi, and the notorious Yoko. I spent a lot of time just walking around John's old neighborhood in Walton and have come to the conclusion that like the alchemists turning ordinary metals to gold, Lennon had the unique ability to distill his dreamy compositions from the breezy day-to-day -day hum of post-war Liverpool into the majestic brain candy we revere today. Standing for a minute by the shops on Penny Lane, the big red buses rush by filled even today with tweedy-looking characters right out of an old 1930s J. Arthur Rank film. The suburban skies are indeed still mightily blue with huge powder puff clouds which roll by in an almost imperceptible parade. The little children, too, look especially mythical with their round faces, big sad eyes, and pale skin. The fact is, it's difficult to believe that anything has really changed much since a teenage John roamed the Allerton golf course, strumming his old acoustic on his way to Paul's, or sunk down in the long willowy grass in a vacant lot off Blomfield Road for a secret make-out session with Buxom first girlfriend, Barbara. Of all the places I'll remember in Lennon Land, Strawberry Fields is definitely not only the most obviously mystical, but so clearly a place of great inspiration and respite for the young, often lonely John. Like Mike McCartney told me many years ago on a whirlwind trip to the Holy Land on assignment for my first book, the Beatles are Liverpool and Liverpool is the Beatles. Indeed, John Lennon's receptive intelligence, biting wit and great art have a lot more to do with the Church of England's Sunday School, Bill and Ben the Flower Pot Men and the English Music Hall than Yoko Ono's vacuous gobbledygook, or the artist's post-Beatle political avant-garde self-indulgent ramblings. Even today, outside St. Peter's Church in Walton Village, where John first met Paul, is a large sandstone monolith, thick at the bottom, then tapering off into eternity, which is inscribed only, Peace. A phrase John certainly bandies about in this rare collection of interviews, and one we should, of course, all do our best to honor today as well. In the meantime, sit back and enjoy the engaging philosophical perambulations of the very ordinary, incredibly complex, painfully conservative, outrageously artsy, terminally good-natured, trusting and amusing late John Winston Lennon. In this rare piece, Lennon discusses the unexpected impact of Sgt. Pepper and what it meant to him. Sgt. Pepper, the actual song, was a rock song. Yes, just please, happened to sing about Sgt. Pepper, here, which happened with the title, which Secretary happened to tie up with the whole Bridget. concept, you know, but it was still just some, Ross. you know, some songs, you know, some yeah. fast and some slow. But the package, okay, you know, like, so very great. the sort of overall image of it was the difference. Yeah. Okay and the linking of the tracks and all that, but it still didn't make, uh, the make the songs themselves any different. Yeah. People recorded them individually, you know, the songs, and it wasn't... People didn't record Getting Better from the opera uh, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Heart Club right. Band, you know, they just recorded Getting Better as a pop song, you know. Well, Sergeant Pepper, Pepper, Pepper was, yes, yes, was significant so, yeah. in our lives, yeah, and therefore it... See, it's... Our LPs reflect where we're at at the moment, you know, and Sergeant Pepper reflect reflected yeah, the well, changes we that we've gone wait, through so and we don't want you know, any, uh, what we're looking forward to. Like and uh, so it was significant. I'm not putting it down, yeah, I think it was, but it wasn't no, it wasn't an opera. <coughs> you know, any so any one of the numbers could stand in their own right individually. Sure. It's like um, a box of chocolates. In Sergeant Pepper we wrapped the chocolates up and yes. you know, put nice papers or wrapped two chocolates together. But yeah. all we had in fact was a box with chocolates in still. You know. 
Throughout 1969, Lennon was extremely close with Apple man Derek Taylor. In this interview, listen carefully, and you'll hear both Derek and Yoko adding their two cents worth. I can never go anywhere without being attacked. And then I think, well, if you really wanted to, you could shave your hair bald, shave off your moustache, and go to Egypt or India. So who are you kidding? You know, we say, well, I want to live in England because I was born here. Then I wouldn't be myself, that's the reason mm -hmm. I give. But if myself wants incognito so much, mm -hmm. myself would be that bold, shaved mm -hmm. man in the middle of India. So, so that's like losing identity too. So that's like, you know, works out two ways, doesn't it? Yeah, so the, that's where it's at, really. Of course, there's less, there isn't Beatlemania going on, and because I'm acting more naturally, whatever that is, I'm not, I don't have to keep up the, any image, you know, I mean, I can. I'm acting as an artist now, as an individual, mm. and I'm not responsible for the Beatles' image or anybody else's, and I don't have to sign autographs unless I feel like, you know, and all Even that. So they're the beginning to accept like that, you know. There's one or two people get uptight and things like that. But I just have to stop it <laughs> because as a Beatle, it was either sign everything and be everything they wanted and always smile and always react to high and all that, or we went the other way, which is hiding and wouldn't see anybody, wouldn't see the press, kept the gates locked. Yeah. But now I do it on whim, you know, just let it roll. The only friends I got are the sort of the Beatles and the Derricks and the Neil and the Peter Brown have been with us over the years. And a few more people are picked up, you know, here and there. But they, people can be hangers on and friends, you know. I've had hangers on that have been friends that have dropped off. You know, because we didn't have enough to give each other. I must have something from a friendship, you know. And we picked up a few new ones sort of from Yoko's side of life that are so determined not to be hangers on. They don't want to know. They pretend Beetle doesn't exist. Well, <laughs> Derek sort of put in a nutshell the other day, really. He said, a good, intelligent friend, whether he worked for us or not, which he would be, you know. I mean, there's certain things I'd ask him advice on, you know and discuss with him or be pleased to see him about you know. But there's... You've got to have a hook in friendship. It's not really enough just to... There's got to be some good thing you can get going on. Yeah, when, when you're older there has to be, because in the, when you're younger all it needs is somebody to go to the pictures with, with, you know, or get pissed with. But when you're older the relationship's got to sustain through a few years, you know, that Something. I could go away for four years and come back and relate the story to Derek and there wouldn't be a big gap between us. The sort of hangers on would have lost, they would stay at the level they were when we last had them hanging on. You know, they sort of, the glory rubs off on them and they turn into sort of something or other and they go off into swinging London, you know. Well, I'm a sucker for people, you know. I'm not very good at, I go by people's faces and if they look straight, you know, I just <laughs> believe in them and I've had a lot of bad experience like that, you know. But it hasn't hurt me too much, just sort of, oh really, yeah. is that what they wanted, you know, and all that. And so between us we try and watch for it, we discuss okay. everything in minute detail, you know, but it's good about though, everybody it? we meet and, you know, what <laughs> do they want or they con in us, because I've been conned all my life, you know, since I was a Beatle. When he said uh, the Beatle that he went through, he, may, you know, really meant the Beatle mania, you know, era, you know. But I think everything has a natural course, you know, and when it's necessary, they exist, you know. When it's not necessary, it goes. So the fact that it's going on means that there's still that necessity, and it's good, you know, that's good. Because the Beatles are always discussing, uh, should we go on or shouldn't we? Why, what are we together for now? And when it gets down to it, I like playing rock and roll, I like making rock and roll records. Now, I have either a choice of, if I want the whole LP to myself, is to get a few musicians together. Now I know that I've played with other musicians, just very rarely, but I've occasionally played with them. It needs some work together to get anything good going. You know, I don't like session men at all. I try not to use them. I don't like violinists or anything these days. I try not to use anybody but the Beatles. And if I wanted to make a record, I'd choose the Beatles. You know, I can say to Ringo, give me um, Bebopalula, you know. So therefore, we've got that going, you know. And even from a commercial point when we discuss it, we think, now, what's the biggest selling name, Beatles 
or John Lennon and the Fabs or George Harrison and the Fabs which where, where's our biggest market is Beatles who are our closest friends Beatles who do we have most arguments with Beatles so Beatles is it you know in this segment, Lennon reflects on the relationship between who he is, the extraordinary life he leads, and virtually everyone else. I'm doing my own thing, as they say. You know, I mean, it's maybe we're a masochist or something, I don't think so. No, no, he's a very intuitive person, you know, and, and uh, he's it's just that, what... See, you probably go through exactly the same torture as I go through, but it's not publicised, you know. But everything I do, and Yoko does, is publicized so we seem to go through it for other people but all we're doing is really sharing our sorrow and joy with the rest of the world and it's a it helps us to get through whatever we have to go through to know that other people understand because there's lots of people do and other people write to us and say now they feel to, together with us simply because they're in love or because they want peace or because they like music or something like that so it, it's a good it gives us a feeling of belonging you know, and we're not so alone in the universe. You know. So I don't know whether we're actually going through it. We're only going through it for them as much as film stars do on celluloid, I suppose, you know, and people relive the experience I mean, of other said. people on the screen. So people may tend to do that with us. But yes. they have to do their own thing, you know, and, and live out their own bit. But if they associate with us through that, that's all right, you know, because we associate with them. Nobody's really alone, you know, we all influence each other, you know, I mean, everything you do affects us, you know, of course, but everything we do affects you too, you know, so it's just like uh, a whole world is like one entity, actually, isn't it? We're not trying to show anything, I mean, we're just living, we're just sort of vegetating, you know, we're like just sort of uh, an existence that sort of is vague, you know, a vague existence whatever that is. And uh, anything that you get from us probably is a reflection of yourselves, you know. We're not trying to project any definite image, you know. I mean, you're getting something out of us. Probably it's already in you, you know, it's that. Because it's, it's enough responsibility living up to your own image of yourself. Like George is always quoting Gandhi, you make and preserve the image of your choice. And uh, we can see these images keep being made, you know, like we made a peace image and we made a plastic Ono image and to an extent we've got to live up to it. But it's like the karma yeah. action reaction. We keep got plonking things and then there's a reaction and then we find that we have to do that again, you know. But we're not sitting back thinking, uh, working out, working it out, you know, we're just drifting along with it, exposing ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we're doing. You know, instead of, it was like for our honeymoon, we would have been chased around the world like Jackie and whatever Onassis. it is, Onassis and that. But instead of hiding from it, just sort of saying, okay, you know, mm -hmm. and answering anything they want to say, you know, okay. and not having a press conference that lasted <laughs> two hours where the mighty Beatles spoke, mm -hmm. you know, but to allow the press in Amsterdam and Montreal to ask and ask and ask till they got time, no time limit like today even at first, you know, it just, and you can come back again till you've got rid of everything you want to know, and maybe that will sort of clear the air or something, you know. Mm -hmm. but I don't know whether it did or not. It certainly created a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. We still have our private life, really. You know? I mean, you know, I like it. Well, I'm, I'm sure that everybody's life is like that. But there's many, many layers, you know. I mean, it's not just one layer. So, of course, you know, no matter how we try to expose ourselves completely, there's still many layers left that, you know, it's not exposed. But the attempt yeah. to expose ourselves is almost like an attempt to not avoid things, you know, to face up to it, you know. So we just want to face up to it. I thought of it, it happened over things. just years of maturing or whatever you call it, mm -hmm. about suddenly realizing the res responsibility we all have for the whole world. I've always been, a, I was the, the clown of the class, you know, and that was my way of getting love or attention or whatever it was, you know. And so whatever I do, I have to be myself to a degree, you know. So now I'm allowing myself, and because of Yoko's encouragement, to be myself completely. I'm more like I was when I was 18 mm -hmm. than I was yeah. when I went through the Beatles thing. I got a bit wrapped up in showbiz or whatever it was, you know. The Beatles thing was a sort of cocoon, you know, of growing up, you know. And so now here I am being me, and uh, the next objective is whatever, you know. And I think it's calmer. And, I take it like dice throwing, you know, now. 
I mean, the people keep coming up with Nigerian Biafra things for us to do. Now, like, we've got about till this weekend to decide which to do, you know, yeah. and what to do about it. And there's no getting out of it, because just in our own heads. Well, we're, we're just doing it natural, you know, this is us, you know. In other words, we're not calculating, well, let's do it this way so that would be good or bad. But I mean, we're doing our best, you know, yeah. and the best often becomes something funny, you know. And uh, we like that, you know. It's a danger I went to as a Beatle, I, I, you know, there was a natural, they were the natural four lads from next door, you know, but it was an un unnatural naturalness that we got into. So I'm I'm aware of that, you know. So I'm not going to get into that. And the next na yeah. natural, unnatural act that we could get into is the intellectual art bag or whatever it is. But yoga's been through that and I'm definitely yeah. such a, a working class chip on my shoulder. I won't allow it. So I hope to be, we'll save ourselves from that, even though we're going into the films and all that, that bit. You know, they came from the same district or something like that. Now, we come from ends of the world and so uh, I don't know it has a, a lot of good balancing you know very nice. and uh, also um, I don't know it's just you, you see if it comes to something like uh, uh, well because we declared our love or something we have to always look like lovers etc if you do if you think that we're doing that you know it's quite the opposite I mean we just forget about the fact that we're in front of people and and uh, sort of, you know, say things to each other or something, sort of, you know, be very cynical about each other or something. And then later I think, oh, you know, because they do think that's John and Yoko, you know, and they're thinking, well, what sort of relationship, you know. And uh, we're not showing our best foot forward. Believe it or not, back in those old post-acid days, some people actually thought of John as God. Amazingly, Lenin was at one point amongst them. Here's the scoop. Well, if I was, you know, I'd be doing mm -hmm. miracles, you know, and that's the fact. There's many of them look like Christ. I mean, I think Christ was a groove, you know. I mean, if there was one round, we'd know about it, you know. And also another thing, you see, we went through that discussion, but, you know, that we want to know what we are really, you know. I mean, I went through acid trips, and I thought, oh, but, uh, it must be Christ and all that, you know, but it was just... Yeah. Discovering the responsibility mm -hmm. of the world, you know, but was you know, ours. Then, then we came to a conclusion that we don't have to really know. In other words, you know, say if we were something, why do we have to know, you know? All we have to do is just be our, ourselves, naturally. And what we were is something that somebody will decide later, or if they, they don't ever have to decide, you know. He yeah. never said, I'm anything, just no, son of God or son of man, God. and we're all that, Everybody's you know. So it was all the others that laid on the beat image on him, wasn't it? So, you know. And now here is yet more on the making of the classic, The Ballad of John and Yoko. I am oh, here as you are here and you are me and we are all yeah. together, so we're all one, you know. George came up to me after I'd written the lyrics, or just while I was doing it, and said, you should have just made it easier by saying, changing one of them to, to crucify us or you as well. But because the lyrics and everything happened so naturally, it sort of happened when I was half asleep and I woke up, wrote them down and they, that was it. So anything else would have been translation, so I thought, sod it, it you know. Came out it came out naturally. And I thought, how many, we have said it a lot of times, we believe we're all one or interconnected. Mm -hmm. And because we did it so quickly and then Paul and I just knocked it off one night without the other Beatles even and it was, it had to get out quick because it was like news and it was a ballad of today about what us two would. So I didn't have time to, so the thing like Wars, any of the other so-called songs or whatever they are, usually there's a period where I play around with them and push a little word in here, change a little word there. But this was just like news, you know, like you make your spelling mistakes in the paper the next day or 500 were dead, but it was only 460 or whatever. I didn't have time to, to work out what other people, the reaction to it, really. I had to just get it out. Here's a terrific question. What would John do if he were elected king of the world? If being prime minister really gave you the power, which I don't think it does, I'm not sure where the power, that kind of power lies, you know, behind or... I'd just say, you know, stop that war well, and stop selling arms and all that. Just, you know, that. I don't know how much power the prime minister has, you know. First of all, I'd say get rid of your arms and get some forks and shovels and start digging the land or something. Use them as a an army to go and dig the desert or something like that and help other countries, you know. I mean, it's not just John, you know. I mean, even uh, sort of somebody, a writer, a writer, you know, who 
written a bestseller book or something. I think he or she would have much more influence than any prime minister. So I basically believe that, you know, power is a mental power, you know. So that he has already. I mean, he has much more power than a prime minister, you know. I mean, what can a prime minister do, you know? Just on a very physical basis, maybe he can do something. But the artist has more power, I'm sure, you know, than any politician. In this piece, Lennon speaks frankly about the rigors of fame and fortune on his woefully middle-class ego. I had a tremendous ego that got me where I was, really, mm -hmm. you know. Oh, nice. But I spent two or three years <laughs> killing, it. killing it stone dead, you know. It was terrifying because I'm a naturally nervous and paranoid person, and without an ego I was nothing. <laughs> it was terrifying, you know, I just leaned on Paul or the other Beatles, whatever, you know, who hadn't destroyed themselves. So I just thought, well, get rid of the ego, and then I'll just be the B-side of the record, and I'll just let Paul run it, or I'll, you know, just let, carry me around, you know, I won't be that guy that was at school pushing and started the group and all that, I'll be something else. And I was just coming out of it about the t just before I met Yoko, and I was India helped a lot, three months out there. And the meditation was as big as acid trips, you know, in changing my whole thing, you know. I just suddenly was tapping this source of power inside myself. And just vast vistas of creativity that I could manage if I could just hold it and get back, you know. But then, if I hadn't got back and met Yoko, I might have got swamped by the, this whole scene, you know. I tend to lose it all again and think I can't do anything. But then what she came along, so I was saying, you're great, you know, and I like your drawings, you like everything. And so I'd be sorting out everything from me past, saying, look, I, I wrote this in my... <laughs> That's what I think was really great about us, was that uh, I'm an egotist too, you know, I'm a big ego, just as big as... Yeah, I had to get an ego to counteract hers, <laughs> you know, or it That's would have been impossible. Though. I couldn't have survived even as a power. I, it's all right leaning on a group of guys, you know, because they play it very subtle and allow you to, you know, have your, whatever, I can't think of the word, but with a woman, you know, there's no chance. You're really dirty if you don't fight. You know, she had to have a sparring partner. It was really funny because um, I was such a big ego. I just was coming to a point that, um, I was doing everything I want to do, you know. And like, when you get to that point, it's just very lonely, you know. And I thought, oh, so for uh -huh. all the things that I got, you know, the price I pay is to be lonely. Uh, yes. And I got frightened yeah. and everything. And I was very frightened then, you know. And I met John, and then if I usually meet a man or something, then, you know, my ego would always stand, you know, between the, the thing, you know, and I could never sort of get over that, you know. But, uh, and that, that naturally would have happened, but the thing is, you know, I was really taken by him, you know, and like, it's a really corny, you know, expression, but really love did it, you know, like, without love, why would I have that, you know, I mean, the ego could never disappear, you know, and that was it. But, uh, so everything I said was, uh, or did or something, you know, was just a very natural thing out of love, you know. I wasn't particularly wanting to do it that way, you know. I thought, well, I don't want to. First of all, when I met him, I thought, well, I'm not, I'm not going to fall in love or anything, because that's disastrous, you know. So that's death for me or something. So I was trying to escape from that, you know. And that. So it wasn't like, uh, you know, I didn't know what I was doing for him at all, really. I thought I was destroying myself or something, you know. But it wasn't that really, and it just did very, you know, great thing for yeah. both of us, you know. When we <laughs> first did the acid and bit and all that, and the, the religion and all the bit, it was all that, oh, it was your, our ego that was interfering with our relationship together as Beatles, you know, that uh, we suddenly saw each other back to when we were 15, like I saw, you know, we saw each other at that age and what we were then and what we developed into. And then it was all the reading, the different books, and you know, the leery handouts and all that, saying about ego. And we all got into the bit where we thought ego was bad, you know. And what's it really like to be a Beatle, Mr. Lennon? You see, it's, it's so long since I've not been one. That it's, it, it's like I was trying to imagine what it's like. I was trying to recreate the feeling of buying Elvis's record in the old days, because we just finished one. I was looking at it and touching it. I was trying to not be me, you know. 
and it's just impossible. <laughs> I couldn't describe it, you know. It's like uh, being permanently in a white bag, you know, <laughs> and people are looking, but they do not never see, really, you know, I mean, on average in the streets, I mean, and things like that. So I'm, I'm on like a permanent trip, you know, where mm. the, everybody's voice is slightly in the distance. I'm, I'm, you know, in a permanent high state because of people's, you know, if people uh, worship something, something rubs off on them, mm. you know, so the, with the, what I've done and what people have done to me, they've cocooned me and my life and my wife and everything in this sort of bag. Mm. And so I'm um, immune to a lot of things and very unimmune, you know, it's a bit of both, like if you're in, if, when you're in the white bag, you will white bag gig, <laughs> yeah, there's a risk you get kicked when you're sitting around the floor because yeah, people are so interested like in that. But there's also the womb thing, so I'm in this kind of polythene womb, mm -hmm. you know, and every now and then something gets through and I actually get touched, you know, and then I, I say, well, now, why is that person, <laughs> what are you doing in my kitchen, or, you know, <laughs> why are you letting down the car tie, or demanding my arm, and then I have to think through that, but normally it's just like a kind of high, or a low, you know. Lennon drew on a vast field of sensory and intellectual experience when composing, here he responds to a reporter's questions concerning the effect of mantra and thus repetition on his work. What you write is influenced only by everything, not by specifics. Maybe something will influence you more. If the chair leg broke, you know, you might drop that into the into your song you're writing on that bit of paper now. But I don't specifically think uh, uh, in an alert meditation, therefore I'll put mantra into the song as a basic format for, you know, it just happens, uh, but everything that happens to me uh, it rubs off on me, you know, and I'm influenced by everything and everyone. So it's no deeper than that, you know. In this charming interlude, John remarks on the rather extraordinary ending of Hey Jude. Well, the ending was so good, we kept, we kept on going, you know, when we got into it, we couldn't stop it. On a lot of them, you know, we get into an ending, but we never got seven minutes. That ending was so good, it was, you know, on its own. We really hammered it home on that, you know. Generally, your average garden variety journalist in those days was pretty square and had a hard time appreciating the ingenuity behind the creation of the Lennon's various bed-ins. Here John is asked to go on record concerning the influence of the offbeat protests. There are thousands of letters from people who have been influenced by it, you know, and that's apart from just the, the good stuff in the press like cartoons, etc., etc. Yeah. We appreciate the cartoons, whether they're for us or against us. You know, if it gives people a laugh, a laugh is a release of tension. So we don't mind being uh, Abbott and Costello for the world, you know, and we'll do that if it relaxes people. Anything we can do, we'll do it, you know. And so cartoons and everything are worthwhile. Any kind of picture of us, whether it's getting off a plane again or, or sitting in the office or whatever, you know, because we're talking about the essentials of life. And most newspaper headlines are not that essential. So we think that our propaganda is as important as the next man's, if not more, because we're talking just about peace and not about what size table. This is the most positive thing. The bed event was the most positive thing that our two minds, which are pretty well ticking, could think of, whether we appear as freaks or clowns. The effect was that everybody for that period was talking about peace and since then, we threw a stone in the water and the ripples are still going round. And we've had various approaches from various different peace movements asking, what can we do? You know, uh, it looks like the march is uh, going nowhere, which is what we're saying. But all you get is front page headlines of violence after the march. And, uh, you know, we'll think up a few gimmicks for them too. So, I mean, people, we, what we did was say, John and Yoko are available for functions you know, for peace functions, and that's what we did. So it doesn't matter whether they say we're freaks, we are freaks, you know, in their eyes, you know. But who's to judge what a freak is? You know? And it gave a, a great sort of uplifting beat to the whole world. 
And uh, the world was so tense, and now, you know, they started to smile again. It's down to that. If, there's, if the world it was a party, and it was a bit miserable or a bit intellectual, everybody got on, onto one subject, you know, and got like that, and some guy comes in a bit pissed or a bit happy, change the whole atmosphere, even if it's for five minutes, you know. And that's all we're doing. Take the world as one big party, and they're all getting a bit like that, and uh, everybody's talking about what to do and not doing anything. And we say we are doing something. We're the guy that comes in the room and cheers them up. And even uh, our friends, the British press, you know, they're always knocking us and that. But when would they meet us at London Airport? They're friendly faces, you know. I know that they've been watching, seeing me come in for years in various disguises, and I know them as people, and, and what they write is is vaguely what they think, it's not the same. And we know what the game is, you know. And in the song, Ballad of John and Yoko, which is the Beatles' new song, I say, the press, when we got back to London, say, it's good to have the both of you back. Nobody mm -hmm. actually said that, mm -hmm. but it was there in the room, you know. The controversial Cold Turkey was another Lennon classic played by the Plastic Ono Band that long ago summer's eve in Toronto. John responds to a question about the number. I hadn't decided on an arrangement or anything, and uh, I just sang it over to the group, and because it's a, basically a three-chord song anyway, they picked it up quite well, you know, it was just verse, chorus, verse, chorus. So we just really busked it, you know, and this one, Yoko was holding the words, but just out of vision, I had to sort of dodge off the mic to try and get the, one of the verses. So it's entirely different from the single, but you can see where the single came from, you know, it shows the basis of the single. Maybe that a, a, a more professional version of this would have been more commercial, but the single is how I wanted the song to go. And the screaming effect at the end is only a progression from the end of Strawberry Fields or the end of Walrus or Day in the Life, you know. And just the, the expression cold turkey is known among drug addicts, but uh, cold turkey is also known amongst ordinary people, you know. Not just the meat, it's, a, it's quite, not that. Uh, exclusive to drug addiction and it's a, it, I like words or expressions and cold turkey happens to be one of them. I wrote a song mm -hmm. called I'm a Loser when I picked up the expression around, like kick out the jams in my expression, I'd write something called that if there weren't so many of them, you know. And I liked I'm a Loser and Day Tripper I sort of made up out of hearing about trips and before I'd ever had anything to do with tripping as is known and I wrote a song called Day Tripper, you know. And because I like the word, the cold turkey, whatever it means, it means suffering, or it can mean flu, you know, three day flu, or dying in Biafra. It can mean a lot of things besides anything to do with drugs. You know. It can mean whatever you want. Many of John and Yoko's experimental projects were almost strictly autobiographical. Here, John describes the couple's work as a kind of living diary of their unconventional life. You tell me anybody doesn't like reading somebody else's diary. <laughs> That's beautiful. No. Right. Yeah. Who doesn't yeah. write a diary with the idea that it should be written? Yeah, I mean, who, who are we kidding, you know? Yeah. Now, the point is, uh, without, we've, we've made a physical manifestation of our diary. But, I mean, still an watching the last film, you know, mm. like that, and it goes on and on, because that's it's how... It's a very it. honest uh, thing to show, isn't it? I mean, it's the, the most honest thing that happened then. And yeah. yeah, so it's just, it is a diary, you know, and but it always has been, but now it's like, what to, it's to quicken up the process, you know, like the wedding album is, is sort of our heartbeats recorded on these special machines, and this is our next album together, mm -hmm. and us, me shouting Yoko and she shouting John, and it gets sort of vaguely sexy in parts, but then so we couldn't get it out quick enough, you know, because of all the hassles. And then Jane Birkin's done the show, because everybody's going to say, oh, they're copying Jane Birkin, you know, and that's the, the grind of trying to, of this production, you know, whether it's EMI or ICP or whoever it is, of getting the, the mess, the stuff out as you do it, you know. I mean, it's this night like ballad of John and Yoko. I just want to sort of do it right away and not be, have it a great important event about Beatles single or just get them out, you know, if we have one we do it and it comes out every week 
or an album a month or something. A lot of Yoko's work is like that. Yeah. She's just bringing out a book called Grapefruit, which she brought out a few years ago. I'm just giving her a plug here. Thank you. A few years ago, a limited edition, which is sort of poetry and that. But at the end of it, it says, after you've done this, eat it or throw it away. And a lot of her work is disposable work. You know? I think that's how it should be, you know. Not to not to be so worshipping all this good. art all the time. Yeah. You see, when you keep things, they become all automatic grids. They become like tombstones, you know. And uh, the whole world is sort of clogged up with it. So, you know, it's better to circulate a little, isn't it? It's like I was saying to somebody else today. The, the gardener that came with the house I've just bought saw all the stuff I was bringing in. He was saying, it's a load of bloody junk. Because it is. I never had anything <laughs> expensive, you know. Uh, the only expensive things I ever had were a car or a house. Everything else I own is rubbish. You know, he doesn't have very I like keep these, stuff. you know, and boxes and waste very paper tins. things that you can't sell. And all that. And all, all my worldly belongings are those things. And it's stupid, you know. But I still hang on to it, you know. Because it, it's like hanging on to your diary. You really think somebody's going to read it when you're dead or some shit. Whatever makes you keep it. But still, if we make our public art disposable, you know, or unimportant... Over and again, John's relationship with Yoko is a point of discussion, at least in 1969. Once again, Lennon comments. She's encouraged all the other talents, latent and otherwise, that I possess. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, it works both ways. Yeah, yeah. We released each other. Mm. You know, she was in an art bag, avant-garde, you know, inverted commas. And all... All of us, including us two, and all the other people in pop and theatre and all that, intellectualising about there's no barriers between the, the so-called arts and that. Well, nobody actually doing anything, except for lots of poets getting together, and maybe having a rock and roll band, or lots of rock and roll bands together, and maybe having a poet. But it never, it's still in the same bag. So what we did for each other is get ourselves out of it, the bag we were already in, you know, that we were in. I mean, we're still both in the same bag, you know, but... Uh, we're out of it, sort of, spiritually, out of the sort of bag we were in. Say I'm making these LPs with Yoko, that's, that's physical enough. You know. Two versions, this is the next one, and the other one's in the can. And uh, that's just an instance, and, you know, she did a, and for her instance, well, for one instance, I did a live show with her at the so-called avant-garde, or whatever it was, at Cambridge, the students there. Uh, avant-garde music, I took along the electric guitar and Yoko did her voice modulation pieces and that's on here and then Yoko came along to the rock and roll circus of the Stones and I had Eric Clapton and Keith from the Stones and Mitch from Jimi Hendrix group and we rocked and Yoko came on and did her piece with us, you know, they have a show, a, a TV show, rock and roll circus and we were invited to go and perform there. Well, I was, and I took Yoko, and same in Cambridge, they invited her, and she took me as her group, you know. She said, I'll bring my own band, and I was the band. And I did a track from uh, Beatles LP, uh, Blues, and then Yoko came on and sang while we, gig we uh, gigged a 12-bar, you know. She came on and yelled, uh, got her. You know, there was also a violinist trying to play as well, but he lost out. I did a, tra a Beatle track, you know, I did a song that I, it's just a, a song that I knew, you know, I, I, I never remember my old songs, but that was one I could, I reckoned Eric Clapton and then Year Blues it was called, and so I performed that with that super group they were calling it, mm -hmm. and Yoko came on and took the lead for super group and we backed her. So that was a physical instance of us both going into each other's circles, you know, but what we're really doing is the same, there isn't any barriers, you know, okay. east and west as well. You know. And the Cambridge thing was done in uh, March 2nd. In fact, you can take it with you and laugh about it later. We're in the process of just finishing off uh, the next album and we're halfway through the one after next. So production level's gone up a million percent on all fields, you know. And we've both got books coming out, individual and together in the States and here shortly. Yes. And lithography coming out. Somebody, we just got in on the Picasso come, what you call it, scene, you know, lithography, some firm news and that. My book is one based on a show yeah. I did when I first met Yoko. I had a gallery show, sort of yeah. dedicated to her, which 
Yes. There's no details on it really, which I'm using the press cuttings and the photographs and all that, and the reactions. Yes. I sent balloons out to get replies to it. Yes, yes. I sent all that in the visitor book, what people said about it, and put that as a book. Yes, you know. well, he sort of discovered so That's what that is. Like. Oh, it was just a canvas which said you are here when you got in. Mm -hmm. well, you know, like those street really maps, it was based on that. And uh, right, you went through okay. a whole pile of cripple boxes, I think it's called them. You know, which was, I don't yes. know, charity boxes with dogs. No, I mean, he's the biggest begging. producer there. And he went through all that. And I wrote right. to the critics saying, what uh, do you think of my show? And they said, what show? <laughs> you know, I loved it. And that was last May, but that's with all the shit that's been going on, you know, with Apple and Northern Songs and that. It should have been out before, you know, so I can't get... I can produce as fast as anything, but getting it out is another job, so that's why they're okay, all I'll a bit give you the behind now. time, you know. Well, we're compiling stuff together, you know, which, which isn't which isn't in a finished enough state yet, but there's lithography and, you know, just any, you name it and it's coming out, you know, it's just getting it together. I had outlets like in his own right and Spanish in the work and the people doing a play of it and that. All very cute, but there's plenty of things. That's one, that was one in two books in four years. Now, but now, now you know, we sort of That's spark each other off, you know, so it's like we've got too much time, to do. See? And we That's really have, uh, to have to be selective now about which things we do and which we don't. Yeah, I always uh, oh, dreamed of this woman okay, that well, I'd be oh, physically oh, attracted the, the to and had a brain, you know, where we're going to think she didn't exist. Good. She's one in a million. Good. And uh, she's uh, tough because she had to make uh, it on her own in a, an art world, which is a, as a snide as show business, if not more, you know. And it's a tough world there, uh, and she's a tough woman, but like I'm a tough guy, but I'm also not tough, you know, it's both black and white, you know, completely weak and completely strong. So if one of us is strong and the other one's feeling weak, the other one can carry it along, you know. It was like the Beatles used to do that for each other as well, if one fell a bit down. So we do that for each other, you know. I think that's the best part. And when we're both strong, we're very strong. If we're both, we, we hide. Jeffrey Giuliano is the author of some 30 internationally best-selling books on the Beatles, John Lennon, and other iconic musicians of the 1960s. In 2006, his book, Paint It Black, The Murder of Brian Jones, was made into a film by Stephen Woolley and Nick Powell entitled Stoned, The Wild and Wicked World of Brian Jones. It remains a cult classic and the only film bio of the Rolling Stones. Giuliano is also a veteran journalist, having written for dozens of high-profile newspapers and magazines, including The Sunday People, The Daily Mail, The News of the World, The Mail on Sunday, Playgirl, and Rolling Stone. A noted film actor, Giuliano starred in such movies as Vikingdom, Scorpion King 3, Jules Verne's The Mysterious Island, The Fifth Execution, Far Cry 3, Fire Fire Desire, among many. In addition, he hosted the long-running North American syndicated radio series Jeffrey Giuliano's Roots of Rock for five years, as well as pioneering the audiobook industry in the 1990s by authoring, narrating, and producing over 250 original, non-book-based, interview-driven productions. Giuliano's publishers included Random House, HarperCollins, Delta Entertainment, Dirk and Hayes, Playaway Audio, Speechworks, and B&B Audio, among dozens more internationally. In 1998, Random House acquired his firm Tribute Audio, for which Giuliano acted as CEO and publisher for five years. His best-selling audiobook, That Fateful Night, True Stories of Titanic Survivors in Their Own Words, was nominated for a Grammy. In 2014, Jeffrey Giuliano founded Icon Editions and G2 Media Arts to market his updated works as well as publish new projects. As a visual artist, Jeffrey has been showing in galleries across America since 1977, garnering impressive reviews. His first professional assignment was designing several t-shirts for The Who's Pete Townsend in 1976. Jeffrey also designed and illustrated many of his original rock biographies for the biggest publishers in the world from 1984 to 2006, as well as designing for his pioneering record label, Samba Records, in the mid-1990s. From 2006 to 2011, Geoffrey was also the primary designer for the French fashion house Cotai.
When Giuliano first conceived of creating his own literary imprint, Icon Editions, he became responsible for illustrating and designing 35 book covers, several hundred CDs, DVDs, as well as dozens of promotional posters, and eventually, an entire collection of exclusive fashion and art. The expansive design by Giuliano Brand grew out of Jeffrey's impressive commitment to the arts and is the culmination of a lifetime's work by an extraordinarily talented and determined Renaissance man.